Hello, I'm Kingsley Singleton and welcome to this Adobe Lightroom video lesson. In this tutorial, I'll be offering you a quick start guide to using Lightroom and running you through the process of importing images via the library module and improving them using the develop module. There's more information in the step-by-step -step guide in this month's magazine, plus we'll be covering many of these tools in a bit more detail in later installments. For now though, let's crack on with our quick start guide. Once you've got Lightroom open, the first thing you need to do is import the files you want to develop and catalogue. You do it by clicking the Import button down here, or by coming up to File, and down to Import Photos or Video. Once you do that, the Import dialog will appear, and it's from here that you'll need to find the pictures that you want to import into Lightroom. In this case, I've plugged in a memory card, so the pictures on that have automatically appeared, but if you want to import pictures from your computer's hard drive or an external backup, then you just find them using the menu on the left hand side. Our memory card here is already highlighted so it's displaying the images that are on there and if you look at the bottom of the interface you'll see the options to check all or uncheck all and by default it'll be set to check all. That means all of these images will be imported when I hit the import button but if you do want to just be uh, selective in your import click uncheck all and you can just uh, pick the ones you want but we're going to import all of these into our library and then before we do, just take a look on the right hand side and you can work out the destination that you're using. And you can see here that because we're organizing by date, a folder is being added in our pictures folder using the date that the images were taken on. Now there are lots of other things we can do to the images at the same time as importing them, but because this is a quick start guide, we're just going to hit import to take them through to the library module. Now once the pictures have been imported from the memory card, they'll just reside en masse in the All Photographs section of the catalogue. But if you want to keep a more precise control over your pictures and find them more easily when you want to, it's a good idea to sort them into a collection. To do this, simply highlight them all by pressing Ctrl and A or Command and A on a Mac and then hit the plus sign next to Collections. Choose Create Collection from the list and in this case we'll just call this one Spitfires. Click Create and your new collection will be added in there. Now as I said, we've imported our images into the library module and there's plenty we can do in here bar cataloguing them. Over on the right hand side you can see that we can um, get a quick look at the histogram of each of our individual shots. We can apply creative effects using the quick develop option and probably most importantly we can keyword our pictures so once again they're easier to find within our catalogue. Keywording is as simple as clicking in the box and adding a few descriptive phrases and this will help you search for pictures later on. We can also view our pictures more easily by cycling through the view options down here and using the film strip at the bottom, as well as star rating them and performing basic rotations. The really fun features of Lightroom though are to be found within the develop module, so that's what we're going to look at next. First we'll select a picture to use. This one looks pretty good to me, so we'll click onto the develop module now. And in here we can have full creative control over our picture, especially if it's a raw file as it is in this case. Over on the left we have our navigator, so if we're uh, zoomed in a little bit we can just uh, click and drag our preview around. And below that we have some preset options for adding really rather tasty photo effects. So say we want to add an age photo effect, we just click on that one and it's looking pretty good. What we really want to do though is bring out the best of this photo in a natural way using the manual sliders over on the right hand side. So I'll just press Ctrl and Z to undo that effect. And we'll close down these tabs so that we can get a better look at the image. Now over on the right is the real business end of Lightroom and this is where we make these manual adjustments to our picture. At the top we have the histogram which is a graphical representation of how the pixels of the image are distributed throughout the tonal range. So you'll see here we've got quite a lot of light pixels in the image and that's our light blue sky and not many dark ones down here. Below that we have some tools like the crop tool which we'll be using in a minute and the spot removal tool. And below that we have a selection of tabs, including the basic tab and the detail tab, both of which we'll be using in this quick start guide. The others we'll come on to in later installments. Before we use the basic tab, we're going to use the crop tool. So give that a click and you'll see a cropping box appear around the image. Now we're going to lose a little bit of the dead space around the edges of the plane here, just to tighten the composition. And I'm not only going to click and drag in our corner handles here, just to tighten things up, but I'm also going to rotate the picture to put our plane at a more aggressive angle. 
Now if you want to keep the aspect ratio the same as the original, just click next to aspect and choose original. Then we can drag in our corner handles a little bit more. That's looking okay to me. And when you're done with your crop, just hit done. Then you'll get your cropped preview. Now one of the great things about Lightroom is that all of the changes we make are non-destructive. So say we want to go back and change our crop later on, we just click back on the tool and the original photo is still there. We're just seeing a sort of a cropped preview of it. Now the same applies to all of the other settings we're using. And that gives us a huge amount of latitude in how we make our adjustments. Let's start adjusting the image now by clicking on the basic tab. And the first thing we're going to look at is the color temperature and white balance settings. It's here that we can control the overall color balance of the image just by using these sliders or by using the presets in the white balance list, just as you would find on a camera. So this is the as shot setting, but if we want to make it slightly warmer, we can click on cloudy. And then if we want to fine tune those settings, we just click on the temperature slider and drag it up and down. At this end, it makes our image cooler and at this end, it makes it warmer. So I think something just below that cloudy setting will be good. Something a little bit higher than the daylight setting, which is 5500, but a little bit lower than the cloudy setting. So uh, we'll just pop it slap bang in the middle at around 6000. The tint slider you should only use if there's an obvious color cast on the picture, and we seem to be fine in this case. So now we can move down to the exposure sliders, and it's here that we control the overall image brightness and contrast, and also look to preserve detail in the highlights and shadows. All of these sliders are interlinked. So while the exposure slider broadly makes the image lighter or darker, the other sliders can be used to fine tune specific parts of the tonal range. The first thing we'll do is just uh, duck the exposure down ever so slightly to about minus half a stop. And you can see that as I pull that left and right, the histogram changes. So as I say, about half a stop there works for us. And then we can come down to the contrast slider and you can see that as I move it left, we take contrast out of the image and as I move it right, the image becomes bolder and more contrasty. In this case, we'll set it up at around plus 25, but we can move back to any of these sliders as we work through if we want to fine tune anything. The highlights and shadow sliders affect the upper and lower parts of the tonal range and these can be used to make the equivalent parts of the picture lighter or darker. So here you can see that I'm making those highlights a little bit darker by dragging it to the left. And there's also a handy preview up there on the histogram showing exactly which parts of the tonal range we're affecting when we touch on the slider. The highlights I'm going to take down to about minus 80 so we get a bit more detail back in there. And the shadows I'm going to push in the opposite direction just to sort of put a little bit of fill light into the picture and bring out some of those details in the bodywork. In fact, we'll take that all the way up to plus 100. The whites and blacks control the very highest and lowest parts of the tonal range. And these are really meant just to control the clipping points of the image. Now at this point, there's a really handy keyboard shortcut and you can see that if I hold down the Alt key on the keyboard, eventually we'll start to see where pure black pixels are appearing on the image. So we only want a few of those and we'll take it down to about minus 30. And the same goes for the whites and we'll just click and drag that one up to about plus 30. The last three sliders in the basic tab are grouped under the presence heading and these basically control how vivid the picture looks. Moving the clarity slider increases the local contrast making the picture look more punchy but don't push it too high or you'll get some unrealistic looking haloing. In this case we'll set it up to about plus 30 then move down to the vibrant slider which helps us improve the least saturated colors in the image. Now keep your eye on the blue sky at the top left of the picture and as I take that up can see that growing in presence really nicely. We'll set the vibrant slider at around plus 60 and finally move down to the saturation slider which affects the overall intensity of all the colors in the picture and it's here that uh, a minus 100 setting will give us a black and white picture and a plus 100 setting will give us uh, something pretty gaudy so we'll need to use that with restraint so we'll set that one at about plus 25. We can now close the basic tab just by hitting the arrow that's next to it. And we can move down to the detail tab and it's in here that we can control the sharpness and noise reduction in the image. Now it's handy at the top of the tab to turn this preview on and we can click and scroll around to see how we're affecting the picture. 
And under the sharpening heading, we'll first use the masking slider at the bottom just to control exactly where the sharpening will take place on the picture. Once again, hold down the Alt key and move the masking slider to the right and you'll see all of those black areas appearing on the picture. Well, that's where there won't be any sharpening. You can also see how the sharpening will be restricted to the details in the picture, which is exactly where we want it. A setting of uh, around about 30 or 40 works pretty well here because we're keeping the sharpening out of the sky and that means we won't uh, sharpen any digital noise in the picture. And then we can move back up to the amount slider which governs the overall level of sharpening. We'll take that all up to about 80. You can see there straight away how the details are beginning to look crisper. In digital sharpening, contrast is added around edges in the picture to give the impression of uh, increased clarity. And you can use the radius slider to govern how broad this effect is. Once again, holding down the Alt key, you can see that radius becoming wider as we push the slider to the right. And uh, if you push it too far, you can get some unsightly haloing effects. So we're going to set this down at about 1.5. And finally, use the detail slider to further govern where the sharpness sits in the picture. Down at the left hand side, we only sharpen the obvious edges in the picture. And over at the right hand side, we have more of a blanket sharpening effect which makes the picture look more textured. So we'll set the detail at about 35, then quickly scroll down to the noise reduction sliders. Now in here, the luminance setting will automatically be at zero. And the problem there is that you don't take out any of the grain in the image that appears when shooting with higher ISOs. So we're gonna take our luminance slider to about 50, and that'll just uh, smooth things out nicely. There you can see our preview is now uh, a lot cleaner and virtually noise free. In fact, let's click on the image as well, just to zoom in and get a much better preview of what's going on there. Below that, we have the detail and contrast sliders, which further fine tune how the luminance noise reduction is added to the picture. But we're gonna skip over them for now and just come down to the color noise slider. And it's this one that controls a lot of that red, green, and blue speckling that you get at high ISOs. And with that done, we can start thinking about exporting our picture. As I said, there are lots of other tabs in here which add exciting effects and help us improve our picture, but in this quick start guide, all we really need to use is the basic and detail tabs. Once we're happy with our image, we can click back on the library module, and to export it, just make sure it's the only one highlighted from the film strip down there at the bottom, and then click export down here at the lower left. Now it's important to remember that we always need to export our raw files because they can't be shared or printed out in their regular raw state. They have to be exported to a JPEG or TIFF format so that we can use them like regular photos. Within the export dialog, we have plenty more options and we can even burn our uh, pictures straight to a CD or DVD or email them if we like. In this case, we're just gonna save them to the hard drive and we can choose to save them in the same location as the original photo. No need to place them in a subfolder this time. We'll also rename our picture and we'll call it Spitfire Final. And then before we hit export, just scroll down to the file settings. Make sure that we've set the image format to JPEG and the quality up at 100. And then we can click export. Up there at the top left, you'll see a progress bar showing how your export is going. And now that that's disappeared, we're all done. So we very quickly added a sequence of pictures to our catalog. We've turned them into a collection and keyworded them so we can find them more easily. And then we developed one of them using the basic and detail sliders just to bring out the best of it as well as giving it a nice crop. Exporting the image means we can print it out or share it online. So that's our job done. Okay, I hope you found that useful and that you'll join me for the next of our Lightroom tutorials. See you next time.